Uh, hey everyone, um, welcome to the Path Ahead webinar series. Um, I, I'm really excited about this episode, both um, for the global discussion about parks and recreation at the ballot box and also the amazing work that um, they're doing in the Bitterroot that's putting an open space on to work both for conservation and recreation. So I'm extremely excited about our guests today. Um, uh, David Weinstein and from the Trust for Public Land and Gavin Rickliffs from the Bitterroot Land Trust. So next slide. First, we'll do a little housekeeping. Uh, we will take your questions at the end. We um, map team, <laughs> you can see on your screen, we'll be uh, monitoring the Q&A and chat. So if you have anything that you'd like to add or share, uh, please do that. If you have technical difficulties, text your issue to 406-200-8240. Next slide. This series is co-hosted by the Montana Office of Outdoor Recreation and Montana Access Project. It was a, a brainchild of the former director, Rachel Schmidt and myself, who realized that it's hard enough in non-COVID times for folks to get together and brainstorm and learn from each other. It's next to impossible during the time of COVID so we took these very content rich, very practical, pragmatic um, sessions, very concentrated one hour sessions and that bridge the gap between tourism, economic development, conservation, recreation, municipalities and rural communities and just sort of lay out the building blocks for what it takes to develop and sustain inspired outdoor recreation access. Next slide. So the building blocks for um, successful outdoor uh, inspired access it are planning, design and construction, funding, partnerships and engagement. We focus on one or more of those topics, those building blocks and each session. This time, though it does have overlap, we will primarily be focusing on funding and we'll be focusing on a very specific type of funding, which is local and state measures, funding measures. Next slide. So the key takeaways are, we're gonna hear from um, David Weinstein about how local and state funding measures for conservation and recreation fared at the ballot box nationally. We'll get an up to the minute <laughs> update on Montana's statewide and local conservation measures, including uh, as you may be reading in the news, uh, Montana's uh, marijuana initiative tax, which is uh, before the legislature right now during the time that they're in session to determine how that will be spent. Um, we'll hear from the front country, front, front lines of front country uh, from Gavin Rickliffs about how their community and communities like Hamilton and the Bitterroot can leverage local bond funds for to enhance and create outdoor recreation access. And we'll have some very pragmatic tips for uh, local funding measures and particularly targeted to rural communities, you know, like Hamilton and the Bitterroot. Next slide. I have included my, the guests, as I've mentioned, we have Gavin Rickliffs, who's the executive director of the Bitterroot Land Trust. We have David Weinstein, who's the uh, Western Conservation Finance Director for the Trust for Public Lands. I'll have each of you give a little bit more per personalized um, introductions during before your presentation. But um, these, suffice it to say, these are amazing experts, amazing resources. And I'm, we're going to hear from them today about the remarkable work that they're doing, which, which it's a spoiler alert. It's pretty good news. And with all the other political news that you're hearing um, and you have political news exhaustion, this is actually pretty good. Um, next slide. So as, as always, we're here because outdoor recreation is valuable. It's the nexus of its health and wellness, quality of life, 
and economic vitality, outdoor recreation, access, and quality access to nature is right at the heart of, of all of that. Next slide. On the why why it's important for the economy, uh, four point four hundred fifty nine point eight billion um, nationally, or two point one percent of the GDP of our country. In Montana, Montana is third place in the nation for the pro, the place that outdoor recreation plays in our economy. The recent numbers put it at four point seven percent of Montana's fifty three billion dollar GDP which is massive. Um, quality of life. The number one reason that tech leaders give for doing business in Montana is the exceptional quality of life. In Maine, they have defined quality of life as livable communities, su stunning scenery, and great recreational opportunities. Um, so that's why quality of life is important. And health and wellness. I mean, we all know it and we know it even more now with, with um, COVID and the COVID lockdowns. Being outside in natural surroundings is healthy. It's good, for, it's good for you. Physical activity in nature is good for you. It's good for kids. It's good for people to socialize. It's good for communities to have spaces to get outdoors. And it's pretty undisputed. Next slide. So what we're talking about today, as I mentioned before, was we're going to drill down on funding and we're going to drill down specifically on public funding. So we, we all are experiencing, we hear about it, we hear about funding measures, we hear about bonds, we hear about open space bonds, we hear about levies. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't know what the, the difference of, among those are. So I'm going to I'm going to explain it really briefly and then have David go into more detail about the, the reality of those types of funding measures. But basically, local and state governments can just budget to do things. They can just put it in their budget to build a playground, um, build in maintenance for trails, et cetera. They can just put it in the budget, paid for with property tax dollars, tax dollars, et cetera. Those types of budgeting line items tend to be lower than some of the other types of funding measures that can be used to do outdoor recreation infrastructure. The second type is a bond. And a bond is basically a local government getting a loan. And, and I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, a levy, Sometimes you hear about levies. Several of the communities have, have um, levies. A levy is a tax. So a portion of your tax dollar goes to pay for that asset. And then I included other, which is a hybrid of some of those other, those other types of funding measures um, of which Whitefish is an example. Um, next slide. Whitefish used a um, secured a loan with resort tax funds um, in order to uh, protect a watershed and which included public outdoor recreation. So on the landscape, um, there are there are you can see the dots. Some are bonds, some are levies, but if you look at the number that have passed over the years, it's big dollars. Um, without the recreational marijuana tax, about $150 million has been generated toward conservation and recreation in Montana. Um, sometimes those measures fail. Uh, there was a fail, one failed in Whitefish. I was very much part of one in 2008 that failed in Flathead County. Um, there, which in 2008, I think Cascade County failed too, um, which coincided with the global economic collapse, which wasn't the name, the official name, but it's the name that I gave it. Um, and even though our numbers were great in Flathead County, um, the, the economic reality of the collapse just made it a non-starter. So sometimes that happens as well. Um, next slide. So I mentioned the, the um, 
the resort tax, you know, Whitefish is one of the communities. Um, I, I don't remember how many there are now. David might remember. I think there are maybe eight, seven um, who are authorized to have a resort tax. And so what we were able to do in Whitefish in order to um, secure protection of a very critical uh, piece of land that was owned by the, the Stoltz family, Stoltz Land and Lumber, to place a conservation easement on it to protect municipal water, we were able to use the resort tax revenues to pay for that land protection in addition to the private and and other public funding that was needed to do that to do that deal so i gave that as an example just as a sort of a hybrid um, of how resort tax can be used to secure conservation next slide with that i'm going to turn it over um, to david who like i said is going to go through nationally and then get a little more granular with Montana and how local con conservation and recreation measures work in Montana. So David, if you'll introduce yourself um, a little bit, talk a little bit about your background and then take it away. Sure, thanks so much, Diane. Um, and I should note that Diane and I met during the Whitefish campaign um, and that was to date maybe one of the, the most fun projects I've ever had the pleasure of working on. And, and like she says, you know, we were able to um, utilize a, a a small bit of resort tax to secure a, a clean state clean water revolving fund uh, bond and it was just a, a great success story and a, a funding quilt that the likes of which I haven't worked on since and would love to work on more um, but again I'm David Weinstein with the Trust for Public Land if you're if I let's see I've been with the organization for about six years although we call it my wayward year in 2019 where I I jumped ship and went back to a, an old employer, which uh, quickly realized it wasn't the right fit and came back to TPL at the beginning of uh, 2020. And if you're not familiar with the Trust for Public Land, we're a national nonprofit conservation organization that is dedicated to creating parks and protecting land for people to ensure healthy, livable communities for generations to come. We're just north of 30 offices around the country and the hub of our Northern Rockies work, which covers Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming is based here in Bozeman. And uh, I'm happy to say winter is back here as I'm sure it is for a lot of you on the, on the webinar. And um, I'm trying not to look at my phone because I have a bunch of friends at Bridger Bowl today that are wondering where I am. Um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about conservation finance today. If you'll go to the next slide on its face, we are a small team that works to generate new public funding and um, protect existing public funding for conservation, for recreation, for restoration, and increasingly for climate change, for health, for equity. Um, and we do that primarily at the ballot box, um, but also work at the statewide level through legislative efforts. If you'll go to the next slide. And the reason that we do that, um, one more slide, is that in the last 20 years, um, the, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. There are huge numbers at play here. This is a bit of a busy slide, but if you'll, if you'll look at the approved funding column there in the middle of that graph, um, you can see the amount in billions that have been created at the state, the county, the municipal, and the special district level, totaling, again, just in 20 years, over $100 billion in conservation and recreation funding. Um, the graph toward the bottom is also a little bit confusing, but it gives you the breakdown on obviously at the statewide level when you're dealing with um, either appropriations or statewide bonding efforts, um, you know, there's a lot of money at stake. So that's uh, more than half of the, the state and local funding that's been generated. But even at the county and the municipal levels, you can see in the orange and kind of that lime green wedge, um, there's a ton of money being generated um, because, you know, people are looking out their back door, back uh, windows. Um, there's rampant growth throughout the West. Um, recreation economies are strong, as Diane already pointed out. And uh, you can see on the right side of this graph that um, these things are passing um, at pretty significant percentages. And 2020 was no exception, which I look forward to getting into. Um, also, uh, you'll note in the bottom left of this slide, uh, landvote.org. This is our database that tracks all ballot measures and legislative efforts that are occurring around the country. So if you're curious about what's going on in your neck of the woods or around the country about all the different funding mechanisms um, that are being utilized, uh, check out landvote.org. It's, it's an open platform website. Next slide. 
So a bit of um, a little bit more contextual history. Um, if you look at the gray bar first, the, the peaks and valleys, um, you'll notice that there's a, a direct correspondence with uh, spikes occurring during even number years here. Um, and that makes sense, right? Because of midterm and presidential election years, they're drying out more people. Local electeds tend to be more interested in putting measures onto the ballot during these years, higher turnout. You know, you can talk to different people about their different philosophies, but um, generally with piggy bank measures and, uh, and sometimes conservation or other progressive measures, you might see uh, a higher voter turnout um, yielding more success. And so you see the corresponding dip during off cycle years. But more importantly, if you look at the blue bars, um, this is the percentage of uh, passage rate that is occurring um, every year, year in and year out. And so I think in the next slide, but you don't need to go yet, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about good times and bad times. On this slide alone, you can see that the, the, the recession that started, that really took hold in 2009, there was a lagging indicator, right? Um, people, people stopped wanting to tax residents. We were all scared and, and everything was crashing. Um, so much fewer dollars being passed and created, but you can see that those blue bars were still pretty high up there as far as uh, passage rates were concerned. So we know that conservation is a priority amongst elected officials and electorates throughout the country. Um, next slide. And then I think I, I quite literally yesterday just got an update to this slide. So I'm sorry I wasn't able to include it because we now, we now have COVID on the right side of the bottom of this graph. But it's a similar graph that, that, that you just saw, but you can tell that in good times and bad times and war times and peace times and boom times and bust times, um, and despite uh, whoever's at the helm at the presidential state and local level, um, conservation finance measures, recreation finance measures are very popular amongst the electorate. And it has everything to do with what Diane um, talked about at the outset. Next slide, please. We at TPL are very proud of our track record and um, it's been fantastic working with uh, great partners like Diane. I met Gavin um, through the Montana Association of Land Trust work and, and we're hoping to work more in the future. Um, and our program was created in about 25 years ago now. Um, and since the creation of that, uh, we're very proud that we've helped communities pass um, over 600 measures at the at an average of 83% of the passage rate. Um, to create over $80 billion and generate more than 110 million yes votes. Obviously, this is not just the trust for public land. We rely so heavily on partners um, and stakeholders and elected officials everywhere we work. Um, but you can get a sense that, you know, we, we do have a lot of institutional givers at our back and we would love to work with you um, at the rural level or at the urban level on any kind of conservation financing or recreation financing efforts that you may have or you're, that you're thinking about. Next slide. So how do we do it? Um, at the very highest level, um, this is kind of, these are the three key ingredients and I cheat by putting in a fourth, but I call this the, the great green triangle. Um, ultimately, these are the three things I'm looking for. Elected official leadership, um, you know, especially in the rural areas, uh, presumably we put people in office because we trust them and we want them to carry decisions for us. And so there's a strong bully pulpit there and we're really looking for elected official support or at least neutrality. Um, we do work on citizen petitions, but you know, almost by definition, if you're running a citizen petition, you're doing something that's anathema to the will of elected officials. Um, in the whitefish example that, that Diana and I have now spoken about, we had a very strong leader in Mayor John Molfeld um, and city council, and that was you know, absolutely invaluable to our efforts. Moving over to the right, that demonstrable need and or risk. If you're gonna be asking your community to raise their taxes, we all know that they're going to want to know why. Um, you need to be able to very clearly articulate uh, why it's necessary, what the benefit uh, will be or risk mitigated, um, and what the future means uh, if you do implement that tax. Uh, again, back to the whitefish example, we were talking about the protection of uh, Haskell Basin, which had everything to do with the town of whitefish's drinking water. Uh, this is very clearly and well understood, and, and not to mention that there are recreation benefits and um, important endangered species habitats and uh, wildlife corridors and continuity and view sheds. So um, there was a lot going for uh, the passage of a resort tax to secure that bond in whitefish. And then of course, community support. Uh, I am one of two field staffers that does this work throughout the West at least, and one of four that does this throughout the country. Um, 
and I'm local in the Parks and Trails District of Bozeman. I'm local in the city of Bozeman. I'm local in Gallatin County, and I'm local in the state of Montana. Everywhere else I'm working, I'm an outsider, right? Um, and we all know that in the West, um, nobody wants anybody coming in to dictate terms or um, to be too heavily handed. So again, the Trust for Public Lands model is to work with great partners like Diane and Gavin to bring technical resources to bear and, and help support the vision of a community um, so that we can make sure that you're accomplishing your conservation and recreation goals. And then I throw in that terrific ballot measure, which I know Gavin's gonna speak about um, from the Ravalli County example over a decade ago now, um, but we can't hammer this home enough. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a, a moment, but really good ballot language is extremely important. Just if, if you remember nothing else from my presentation, please remember this slide. Next slide, please. And so when we get to the basics, uh, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at a number of different things. Uh, each different state statute spells out different financing mechanisms available to a number of jurisdictions, right? Um, notably in Montana, we don't have a sales tax. Um, and so all of my work in Colorado, for the most part, has to do with a, a sales tax. All of my work in Montana, for the most part, has to do with property tax. So the, the figuring out what the funding mechanism restrictions are, uh, limitations uh, and possibilities are is, is step number one. Uh, next bullet. Number two is the amount of that funding mechanism. Again, we're looking for uh, elected officials and their priorities, as well as whether it's state or local staff in the recreation and conservation realms. Um, we need to understand their priorities and what that's gonna cost. And then we need to understand what the community is willing to pay for it. Next bullet. Uh, again, this has to do with one side of the triangle. What are the purposes and uses of the fund? This needs to be clearly understood and articulated. Next bullet is uh, timing, right? This gets back to um, when you're going to be hosting an election. We do a lot of polling work um, that points us and, and models electorates. Um, but you know, you might be thinking about a renewal. Um, if you go too early in some um, jurisdictions, you can't go too early for a renewal. Uh, if there's an urgency like there was in Whitefish to, to protect um, a bit of property, uh, you might even host, we didn't host a special election, but sometimes um, you're put into a position where you need to get something done quickly. So there's a lot of um, thinking and discussion to be done and polling to be done around timing and making sure you get on the right ballot. And the final one I believe is uh, accountability um, and management. So understanding in the community, if they believe that the uh, elected officials are doing a good job, if they trust government, if they think they're gonna be able to deliver on um, a tax that they're being asked to produce. And then are there uh, bitter root land trusts in the community? They're gonna be overseeing these, these types of funds. Is there trust there? What does the accountability for our precious tax dollars look like? That also needs to be very well articulated to a community. Next slide. And then I think this is the last one I'll talk about for the TPL process before kind of talking about what's happened in Montana of late. But um, this is what, th these are the steps that, that I go through with my partners um, toward uh, uh, the creation of, of new funding or renewals. It begins with feasibility research, which that last slide, we kind of went through the basics and the feasibility really lays that out. Um, I've got three research folks that are located all around the country. And basically they make me look a lot smarter. They take a look at state statute. They take a look at all those different financing mechanisms. Um, we work in partnership with elected officials and stakeholders to understand uh, conservation priorities and how much that's gonna cost. And then importantly, we figure out what does a different financing mechanism, whether it's a resort tax or a bond, um, what's that gonna cost the individual household um, so that we can ask voters about their tax tolerance. Um, we also, in the feasibility research, we, we take a look at um, election history, um, whether that's conservation or otherwise, and try to get a good understanding of other public interests that might be coming down the pike that will also occur on a ballot. And that goes back to the timing question again. The second big step of this process um, is polling. Um, we still put a lot of stock in public opinion surveys. There are a lot of questions on the electoral side in the 2020 election cycle about um, the accuracy of polling. Um, we run, you know, in-house every single year, we kind of audit um, the work that our pollsters have been able to do um, and make sure that they are relatively accurate and they have been, frankly. Um, so I, I put more stock and again, this is my humble opinion, not uh, gospel, but 
I put stock in um, pollsters' ability to suss out ballot issues um, a lot more than electoral. I think there's a lot of strange psychology that we saw occur in the 2020 cycle uh, along that along those lines. But again, what are we trying to accomplish in a in a poll? Tax tolerance. The, the conservation priority that elected officials have in mind is commensurate with, with um, those in the community. We want to make sure that um, the demonstrable need is well understood and is favored by a community. Uh, we want to test messengers. We want to understand who might be the best person to carry water on a campaign, who's trusted and who's not. Um, and messages, you know, we do a whole battery on both priorities and messaging around those priorities, ultimately to get to a package uh, that we can then refer to a ballot. Um, the programmatic recommendations um, kind of speaks to the last slide uh, that, that we talked about, you know, it has everything to do with the right funding vehicle, the timing, accountability, purposes and uses and the duration of a program. And then we get to this all important ballot language. Um, the reason I keep harping on ballot language is that we know from our years of doing this that you can run the, the, the best campaign in the world that has all the funding at your disposal. And there really is only one thing that you know you can communicate with a voter, and that is through ballot language. Um, and so we, you know, we, we certainly don't push the line legally, um, but we do try to rejigger um, uh, language that's, you know, largely been based on maybe rote history. Uh, in the past, Diane can speak to this. We work with attorneys uh, at the local level. We have in-house attorneys that, you know, the best things that you can do are really prop up the benefits, put that up at the front if you can, try to decrease legalese. If you're in a situation where you've got resolutions where you can tuck um, you know, all the nitty gritty of a, of a program, but just communicate what you're trying to accomplish in ballot language, uh, we see that that can go a long way. And frankly, we've run campaigns in back-to-back -back years uh, with good ballot language and bad ballot language, and you can see results just from language changes alone. And then finally, we are able to offer campaign help to communities. Um, and so again, the Whitefish example was a good one um, where we have a, we are a 501c3 uh, charitable um, organization that's nonpartisan, uh, but we also have the TPL Action Fund, which is our 501c4. Still nonpartisan, but it does allow us to work uh, once legislation has been introduced or something gets referred to the ballot, we can use that 501c4 dollar um, to come in and help communities uh, run a campaign. Next slide. So that was a bit of the how of the Trust for Public Land. Um, so Diane asked to uh, asked me to give a, a little overview on what occurred across the country. And as she said, it was remarkably good news in a year, in a very, very difficult year. Um, this is a, a direct mail piece um, that, that we created in Denver um, that just passed, uh, I think the first or second of its kind to a uh, sales tax to address climate change. Um, with very progressive equity language, which is very exciting. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can see though across the country that there were 50 measures uh, mounted in 20 different states and 49 of them were approved. Um, again, we were pretty concerned as all of us were uh, come March of 2020 about the future of these types of measures. And frankly, here in Bozeman, um, we had that parks and trails district on the ballot um, and we made a very thoughtful decision in concert with the mayor and Gallatin Valley Land Trust that we were not going to campaign for it because none of us felt right asking voters to commit more of their precious tax dollars as this uh, unknown pandemic was crashing down around our shoulders. And so we didn't campaign at all. And, and you know, I think both because of uh, the priorities here in Bozeman, good ballot language, and that there's a good understanding of what the recreation economy means for Gallatin County voters still said yes uh, to the creation of this new district. So $3.7 billion in total funding across the country was created. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that um, TPL supported over 50% of these measures. Um, one more click of the slide, you can see that these were the, the 26 measures uh, that we worked on or supported or endorsed in 11 different states, uh, all of which passed, which was very exciting um, to the tune of $2.9 billion in funds. So there's no crystal ball for looking forward, but um, again, during a very difficult year, we were very heartened. Uh, we saw record participation um, at state parks, at local parks, in national parks. And so I think voters do understand that um, in difficult times, getting outdoors is good for the economy, it's good for uh, health. Um, and uh, 
we all know that we need to take care of these places and create new places. Next slide. So as I transition to talk a little bit about Montana before handing over to Gavin, um, this is a look at statewide work across the country. The darker green states indicate a constitutionally dedicated program. Um, and the light green might have, uh, they're, they're not constitutionally dedicated and might be limited to, to a bond, say. Um, I continue in the West, at least, to look at both Colorado and Washington State as being some gold standards. Colorado has Great, Do Great Outdoors Colorado and the Conservation Trust Fund, which is um, backed by the lottery and lottery sales. And then Washington State has an, uh, a biannual appropriation into the Washington Wildlife and Recreation Program that has uh, spawned a 501c3 called the Washington Wildlife and Recreation Coalition uh, that, that does fantastic work throughout the state and is making sure that they're at the legislature every other year to ensure funding hits the ground. And so if you go to the next slide, I was very excited to turn Montana green. Um, and so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background on the campaign, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, but uh, tell you about where we stand now. Um, back in 2019, the marijuana people, uh, as it were, that have work on this stuff across the country and are working to legalize recreational marijuana and medical, um, came to Montana for not the first time. Um, but this time they did team up with um, some conservation voices and said, well, hey, what if some of the proceeds from a tax goes toward conservation purposes? And we said, great. Um, and the reason, if you'll remember, there were two measures uh, and two citizen petitions that needed to be mounted it's because the I-190 component is what we think of when we think of legalization. It's, it's the state statute that legalizes recreational marijuana and dedicates uh, funding toward primarily Habitat Montana, the state-run program through FWP that allows for um, purchase of conservation easement, fee acquisition, um, and the creation of access points throughout the state, um, but also for state parks, for a recreation uh, trails and facilities fund, um, and non-game species funds. Um, so those were that was the conservation side. The other side, uh, that was 50% of the funding for I-190. The other 50% was going to go into, you know, substance abuse programs, uh, the state general fund, local general funds, uh, veterinary vet services, um, and I think one other component. And then the CI-118 was just the constitutional change to ensure that only adults that were ages 21 years and older could purchase recreational marijuana because in, Mon in the Montana constitution, adult is currently defined as age 18. Um, so they ran two citizen petitions because you needed 50,000 signatures for 118 and 25,000 signatures for 190. And right in the middle of a raging pandemic that was somewhat unknown, they were able to get this thing onto the ballot, which I thought was impressive in and of itself. Once the measures were referred, um, the Trust for Public Land, uh, Montana Wild Action, which is the C4 arm of the Montana Wilderness Association, the Montana Wildlife Federation, Resources Legacy Fund, and Montana Conservation Voters got together and said, yes, you know, we care about this. We're willing to go out publicly um, because there will be real money coming to the state if we get this thing passed. Lo and behold, uh, we passed them uh, in November. And uh, now we are at the state legislature where uh, we have been reminded that voters of Montana cannot actually appropriate funding. Uh, that is up to the state legislation, uh, legis uh, excuse me, legislators. And so we are now in a process where Governor Gianforte would like to see that funding all go to the Heart Fund, um, which is you know, uh, a health and recovery fund, uh, you know, a, a, a certainly a, an extremely important cause for this state. Uh, but he wants to divert all the money that was going to go in conservation into that fund. Um, and right now we're watching uh, House Bill 5, the, the budget bill, move its way through subcommittees in the House, and it will be coming to the full floor um, toward the end of the month, uh, where frankly we do expect uh, the marijuana money and the marijuana revenue to get diverted away from conservation purposes. Um, but that doesn't mean we're not uh, working hard to ensure that, that money does stay, um, uh, proceeds from recreational marijuana stay in the coffers of, of the, the realm of recreation and conservation. Um, but my cynical self thinks that it might become a, a political chit that gets traded um, as we talk about the all important budgets for other very important conservation programs at the state level. So happy to answer further questions today or offline, um, but that's kind of where we are in the state of Montana. Unfortunately, I just don't see the path right now toward 
uh, a reliable source of statewide funding for, for recreation and conservation through these marijuana initiatives. And so we'll be going back to the draw, drawing board in future years. What we do know is that voters in this state, no surprise to anyone here, very much do care about it. And so I don't doubt that we could try different mechanisms and be even more successful than, than what occurred in 2020. And I think that's it for me, Diane. Oh, and here's just a little local map as I transition to Gavin. Um, don't really need to look at this because Diane already pointed out where measures have passed and failed in, in uh, Montana. Um, but we can see there in the, the southwestern side of the state, the, the green light that is Ravalli County and um, look forward to hearing uh, Gavin talk about what all this theoretical mumbo jumbo means at the local level for a rural community in Montana. Great. Thanks, David. That's a perfect segue there. Um, so, yeah. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Gavin Rickliffs. I am the Executive Director of Bitterit Land Trust. Um, just real briefly, um, I've been here in the Bitterit for 21 years now, and I've been doing this work for 13. Um, so, consider myself really fortunate to be able to live in this incredible rural community and do this work uh, on a daily basis. Uh, we're going to talk, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about a little bit more granular level of the conservation finance that, that David is, is, has been talking about, uh, and that's the Ravalli County Open Lands Bond Program, and specifically uh, how a local bond program in a rural community like ours can be used to, uh, to really create a basis of funding uh, for front country recreation and to leverage additional funds. Uh, from elsewhere, either within or outside the community, uh, to make really great recreational amenities possible. Um, highlighting a couple things, there's there's a fair amount. I'll try and uh, move through this really quickly, but but just to, to flag a couple things that I hope you can take away uh, that you've already heard either from Diane or from David already. Um, how important messengers are uh, in a successful uh, local uh, ballot measure. Uh, for conservation finance. Um, ballot language, we're going to talk about a real specific River Valley County example of that ballot language that David uh, discussed, how important that ballot language actually is. Uh, and then we're going to look at a couple specific examples here uh, in the Bitterroot uh, and end with a couple lessons learned. And then hopefully we'll have some time, I think, Diane, for, for questions, right? Uh, so let's go to the next slide. <laughs> Uh, so what is the Bitterroot Land Trust? We're, um, we are a local um, nonprofit organization. We've been around for about 23 years uh, and we are really um, focused, uh, we've got, uh, in contrast to, to TPL, David kind of gave you a, a, a vision of what uh, the, the breadth of TPL. Um, we're really focused here in the Bitterroot in Inver Valley County, uh, seven full-time staff and 13 uh, local board members really focused on, um, on voluntary tools, working with private landowners uh, who want to voluntarily uh, conserve their land uh, through incentive-based programs, um, and also increasingly working with the community on public recreational work. This has been a bit of a transition for us in a rural community like the Bitterroot to start working on recreational uh, projects. And so let's go to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about what our core missions are. So uh, we really work on uh, water. Next slide. Uh, wildlife habitat. Next slide. And working lands. Uh, that's a, you saw that uh, image already. That's a, a, a working hay farm outside of Stevensville. And then next slide. Uh, what we think of as sort of traditional scenic open space. That's a shot of the sapphires on the east side of the Bitterroot Valley. So that's really kind of the core of who this organization has been and how our community has known us in the past. Uh, and I think that's important. We'll, we'll come back to that, uh, how, how those transitions from communities who have embraced working on uh, sort of traditional conservation uh, and are now looking at front country recreation uh, opportunities. Um, that can be an interesting transition, uh, uh, but one as, as we're seeing in this community, and I know that, that a lot of you are seeing in your growing communities, um, 
there are changing needs that, that come with uh, increased populations and increased uh, um, pressure on, on public amenities and, and resources. So that has really led to the next slide, uh, an increased focus on our part on recreation and trails. And this is a group of employees on a volunteer day from uh, GlaxoSmithKline who were erecting some signs down at the Steve Hall Park right in Hamilton. Um, next slide. So just a little bit of background. So, so this is the, the way we kind of thought about our work here in the Bitterroot uh, in the past. You see a lot of green, that's, uh, that's public land. 73% of Valley County is, um, is public land already. So uh, you got the 100 mile long Bitterroot River running from the Idaho border to the south all the way to Missoula, about 45,000 residents. You're on the doorstep of the largest wilderness complex in the lower 48. So, question is, you know, why front country recreation if you've got all that recreational amenity right out at, at your doorstep? So let's go to the next slide. Um, so, so why does this even matter? And really it matters because front country recreation is nearby. It can be with some effort accessible to all in the community. It really adds to the quality of life. Um, we, it, I mentioned that, you know, this, this is a growing, changing community really has an opportunity to shape uh, growing and changing communities in positive ways uh, and bolster our economy in these rural communities. Next slide. Uh, so let's, so that's, you know, those are some of the reasons why we as an organization, I think as we as a community have started transitioning um, to including recreation and access as a really key component of what we see as important uh, outcome of our, of our conservation work. Um, we still focus uh, very close, uh, a vast majority of our resources into traditional conservation on ag land, uh, wildlife habitat, uh, and uh, scenic open space. At the same time, um, we're really beginning to see, and we'll, we'll talk about the River Valley County Open Lands uh, Bond Program here, we're beginning to see um, the, the beginnings of some really cool public recreation uh, amenities uh, here in the Valley and seeing the community really invest in those, um, both through the bond program and, and otherwise. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the bond. Uh, the Valley County Open Lands Bond uh, was approved in 2006. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. And so I'm not going to go through the uh, this entire um, this entire slide, but but essentially, you know, Diane talked about the the various tools uh, that you can use for conservation finance. David drilled down a little bit, but this is a bond and that bond is, uh, is truly uh, the community coming together to say, we're willing to take a loan and pay for it through our taxes um, of $10 million uh, over a period of time to ensure that the things that are really special to us, the reasons why we live here and work here and play here uh, can continue for the future. Um, this slide is really focused on history. I think the big takeaway here is messengers are so important and credibility of those messengers. Um, our bond really came on the backs of the ag community um, that, that was embodied by the Rural County Right to Farm and Ranch Board. Um, they're the ones who, who went to our county commission and said, hey, we're losing ag land, we're losing our economic uh, engine that is agriculture in this valley. Um, they also knew that, that the bond needed to be broader than just agriculture because of the changing demographics here in the county. Um, but those were truly the messengers that helped get the Ravalli County Open Lands Bond Program uh, over the finish line. Um, note that this was placed on the ballot by, uh, by an all Republican uh, Board of County Commissioners. So I think it, it really indicates that conservation uh, and increasingly recreation is not a partisan issue. This is something that everybody uh, understands is crucial to their quality of life. And that passed in 06 with uh, just under 60% of the vote. Next slide, please. So this is the importance of that ballot language uh, that David was talking about. And the two things I just wanna highlight here is the importance of, of identifying what tools your community can use 
So you'll see purchasing land, conservation, purchasing conservation easements and purchasing other interests in land are clearly called out here. So there's 100% transparency for the voters to say, these are the things we're gonna use our bond dollars for. And then going to the purposes, these are really well vetted. Uh, these, are, these are phrases that have been tested and we know that the community responds to managing growth, preserving open lands, protecting water quality of Bitter River, uh, maintaining wildlife habitat, protect, protecting drinking water sources. You don't see agriculture necessarily mentioned in there. You don't see uh, public recreation uh, necessarily mentioned in there. But those are the, the, um, those are the purposes that really resonated with the voters. Next slide. Um, there, this is a little bit of a busy slide. Uh, this is just to highlight that, that truly, um, when you look at how this open lands bond program in Ravalli County has been implemented, recreation is still a really small part. You can see that little blue wedge there. Those are the, uh, the, the purchased um, recreational uh, amenities here in the valley of the, of the total acreage that the River Valley County Open Land Bond has been able to, uh, to help conserve. That brown wedge there is um, publicly accessible private land that is protected by a conservation easement, but still a reminder for, for rural traditional communities like ours that are really steeped in and comfortable with the idea of voluntary private land conservation. That's the vast majority of what we are still doing here, but introducing this important recreational amenity component as well. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is just a, a reminder of how important that those local bond dollars can be for leveraging additional funds. This is a, I won't go into detail on this slide, but if you look at the light green, that's the Valley County Open Lands Bond Program's contribution to each one of the individual projects that have been funded through the bond. The dark green is matching funding. So on average, it's 25 cents on the dollar for our local bond dollars are getting leveraged, you know, by another, every 25 cents getting leveraged by another 75 cents from outside sources. And that's a great, uh, and that's a great selling point for the bond, and it makes all of us really proud that we're we're utilizing local tax dollars as as best we possibly can, leveraging them further. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's get to a couple examples real quickly. So this is uh, you can see all those uh, elk tracks there. This is uh, Lazy J Cross Ranch in the Sula Basin, the very southern end of the valley, uh, just over a thousand acres. Uh, next slide. This is a conservation easement, the Lazy J Cross, uh, that uh, has uh, permanent uh, public hunting access. You can see those by the, the yellow triangles there. That, that public hunting access is managed by uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks through their block management program. So this is a unique uh, example of taking a conservation of egg and wildlife based ranch uh, conservation easement and overlaying um, some public access for traditional pursuits like hunting uh, on that. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is kind of the other end of the, the recreational spectrum here. This is a, a fee purchase. This is a, the Scalpel Hill Bend Park, which was just transitioned to the city of Hamilton uh, middle of last year. Next slide. That's the trail map there. The southern end in the green is Scott Hill Bend Park. Uh, north of that is the existing River Park. Together, they make about 130 acres and two plus miles of publicly accessible uh, natural riverfront. Uh, and you can see that that's the city of Hamilton. Those, those grids are the streets of the city of Hamilton. So it's, it is uh, going back to our uh, accessible. Why is this front country uh, uh, recreation important here? because it's accessible, people can get there on their lunch hour or after work, uh, it's close and it accesses one of the, the key amenities here in the valley and that's the Bitter River. Next slide. Okay, so this is animated. So let's just go through these fairly quickly. So these are just a couple of, uh, of key points in a three-year project. Um, securing key partnerships is crucial in this instance. Uh, next bullet. Uh, the city of Hamilton is the ultimate uh, holder here and manager of this park on behalf of the public. Uh, our small organization doesn't have $900,000 lying around to be able to create a, a, a park like this for the community. 
So uh, finding bridge financing to be able to get uh, secure the opportunity is real crucial. Um, next bullet, uh, identifying possible funders. Next bullet, uh, negotiating a land purchase with a private landowner. Next bullet, uh, meeting with potentially impacted parties and detractors. We're gonna come back to that, but that's real crucial. Purchasing land, next bullet. Creating a community vision for the land. So getting input from members of your community, including those impacted parties, assembling funding, next. Uh, addressing any contingencies, and we'll talk about those next, in including infrastructure, next, and the neighbors. Uh, and uh, closing and transferring to the public holder. Uh, next slide. Okay, so really we're focusing on how do we get our community engaged in recreation. Uh, next slide. That is the park itself. Um, so here's the question is how do, how do you raise $900,000? Well, starting with that, the, uh, the local bond funding is a huge, uh, it, it's a huge base for, from which to leverage additional dollars. In this instance, the County Open Lands Bond helped provide $350,000 uh, to purchase the Scout Cove Bend Park. That then uh, helped leverage four private foundations, five nonprofit partners, Montana Fish and Wildlife Conservation Trust, Recreational Trails Program. We held a big fundraiser out there. We had 200 plus gifts from community members. Um, and, and I think that really, to me, is emblematic of, of what a local bond can do for your community, is really bring in dollars that, that, that may not, they may be, some of them may be there in your, in your community, some may be coming from outside, but without that catalyst, that core of the Open Lands Bond, we wouldn't have those additional dollars coming in. Next slide. So yeah, key takeaways here is you got to invite your community to participate. That's a that's a fundraiser that was held out there. That's those are several of the 200 plus people who helped make this project possible. Next slide. Other big takeaways here: some lessons learned on our part. Uh, you got to be adaptable. Uh, this was the existing bridge here um, at, the, at the park that goes over a ditch. In our um, infinite wisdom and lack of sophistication with these types of public recreation projects, we figured that we could just do the, the real estate transaction, turn this land over to the city, and, and our job would be done. Um, the funders didn't think that was going to work with uh, recreational infrastructure like this in place. Um, and and frankly, uh, enhancing the recreational infrastructure isn't always the first priority of your, of your public partner. They're dealing with a lot of different uh, competing priorities, streets and sewer and all sorts of stuff. And so getting a, a, a park like this ready for your community, you need, to, you need to plan on that infrastructure piece. Next slide. So that, that bridge led to $130,000 unbudgeted uh, rec recreational infrastructure project uh, that was required before we could transition this land to the city, including a um, trail building, uh, a nice new bridge. Uh, you can see the ADA trail in the foreground, uh, parking lot, vault, toilet, things that we really didn't have a lot of experience with, um, but learned very quickly uh, how, how to work on. Um, other lessons learned, next slide. Uh, this changing identity from a rural community who's comfortable with conservation at a private, uh, private land scale. Uh, and then this is, a, this is a, one of our conservation easements in, in the Victor area. Um, you know, that was kind of what we thought of as trails was uh, a kid running out on his family's ranch uh, along a cattle trail. And now transition to the next slide. We think about those trails a lot differently now uh, as the community grows and changes. Uh, adapting to that change can be challenging. Um, last couple slides, uh, next slide. Um, I mentioned neighboring and, and getting, uh, getting input from those most impacted, especially when there's a change of, from private land to publicly accessible and publicly used land. That change is really scary for nearby neighbors and those folks who are most impacted by that change. And so I can't highlight enough getting with those folks early, listening, understanding what their challenges are. This fence is a little funny because um, in the uh, public uh, process, as we sought open lands bond funding, 
One of the requests during a public hearing was for the fence to be 12 feet high, have razor wire on top and closed circuit cameras to ensure that the public stayed on the public land and didn't spill off into, into private land. That was a little extreme. We ended up here with these, uh, these unobtrusive signs. Um, but I think that goes to, to indicate um, how deeply seated those concerns are when there's change and when the public is going to be involved in being out there and, and getting the input from, from those most effective is gonna be really important for you. Uh, that's all I have for, for primary takeaways. Next slide. I think we've got a few minutes for questions, but thanks all for, for being on board. Unmute self. Um, wow, that was so amazing. My mind just goes through all of these transactions and the difficulty, but the remarkable benefit that the, um, you know, that we all share in making these things happen in rural communities. And Gavin, I so appreciated, uh, I mean, a couple of things that you had to say, I'm going to shut up and get to this question, but, um, you know, you raised a really important point, which is this. When people think rural communities, they think, or they see statistics about how much um, public land is in a county, 73%, why do you need public recreation? It, it, you can't, it does, doesn't paint the picture because the reality is our towns are surrounded by private lands. Like they're in the river valleys or they're you know in accessible places and so, you know, when even though we have this wealth of, of public land, it's it's maybe not front country. And when you look at at um, accessibility and equity issues, what are you going to pile someone in the car and drive, you know, 25, 30 miles, spend gas if you're if you're off work from COVID and you're looking at putting food in the table. So, I mean, I think like well, communities, Hamilton for sure, but a community like Cutbank. You know, Cut Bank has a trail system on, on, on private lands, much like, you know, we have to do in the front country. So anyway, okay, I will, um, I, I could just go on and on because I'm just fast. I'm just so impressed with the work that you guys have done. So um, we have a question from Lucas, which is, um, David, can you elaborate on why the local bond language has teeth, whereas a statewide ballot language did not? in the case of the marijuana initiative? Sure, thanks for the question, Lucas. And there's, you know, there's a couple explanations here. Um, again, when I talked about the difference between a referendum and a citizen petition, when you're having elected officials refer measures in the case of a referendum, um, there are, again, both state and local laws that are dictating how these processes play out. Um, so it's not necessarily that there are more teeth, um, but when you've got elected officials and you've got that elected official support, it goes a long way to ensuring that the will of the people is carried out should the, the will be a vote of yes. Um, in, the, in the Montana statewide instance, we had to do a citizen petition because we don't have a legislature that's willing to put that onto the ballot. Um, and then state statute dictates that, as I mentioned, um, it was almost a non-binding vote by 57% of the people because only legislators can appropriate funding um, from the statewide level uh, or direct funding. So um, we did the best with what we could. Um, we expected legal challenges, we got them, and um, we don't have a lot of legal recourse. Um, and that's that happened in the state of Florida as well. Um, also a citizen petition example. So it's not necessarily the teeth, it's just uh, it's a case by case issue, unfortunately. And in the case of Montana statewide, certain people just don't wanna see uh, legalization occur. And uh, legislators had a different priority for where, where revenues should be directed should it um, occur, which is what's happening now. Thank you. Uh, well, we're, we're at one minute left, so I just want to point out a few th things. One is, um, Every other Thursday, I call it the Bob's Bob's List. Um, we host Bob Walker's Front Country uh, Bill Watch List, and so he's tracking Front Country 
As opposed to backcountry, I think there are other groups that are tracking um, habitat, wildlife, and uh, fisheries type um, legislative issues of Montana Wildlife Federation for one. Um, but, but we are focusing on issues that affect trails, trail funding, parks, park funding, um, bicycling, bike lanes, active transportation. So those, those types of front country legislation. Our next webinar coming up is so fascinating. Uh, we all have Megan from Headwaters, Megan Lawson from uh, Headwaters Economics to talk about the recent research that they're doing in partnership with Strava and the Whitefish Trail um, and Doug Haberman and Transportation Bike Walk Montana. Yes, thank you. Um, we will have um, Headwaters will talk about their partnership with Strava and how they are able to take um, data and make economic projections about the impact of outdoor recreation and usership uh, for communities that may not have a trail counter or may not have that raw data to work with. Fascinating. Um, so tune in. On April 13th, we have the, um, an a very unique partnership that really caught my eye. Um, the Anaconda Community Foundation um, funding and helping the Anaconda Trail program get started through um, fascinating again um, keep in touch and let's see um, I think that's it um, I put resources to contact David and Gavin um, on the website these episodes are recorded if you want to check them out later you can go to, um, to our website if you want to share them with a friend, you can go to the website, which is mtaccessproject.com. Uh, I think it's on the last slide and you will be able to get this presentation and the um, actual webinar. Here are their contact information. Please feel free to follow up with them. Mine's, Did I put the wrong? Oh, I put just, the wrong. Yeah, mine's not accurate, but that's okay. Um, I'll just uh, it's kind of because I did it at, you know, um, a 1059. Um, I'll change it and make it. Oh, there you go. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll get that. Yeah, course. Mine will need to be changed as well. So I can, I can do that as well. Okay. I, I did it at the 1059. So my bad. You, you, um, pronounced, you pronounced my last name, right? Which that's what usually gets messed up. I so. do because I remember Weinstein rhymes with Einstein. Um, <laughs> I'll never forget that. It was the first. Hi, my name's David Weinstein. Rhymes with Einstein. Um, I always remember that. So thanks, everyone. Uh, we're two minutes over, but um, like I said, if you want to share, you can um, tune in, and I'll get those emails corrected. And um, thank you so much. I'll sign off. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for attending.